Income tax 2023-2024. Depreciation of rental property tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because if taxes were an animal, the government would definitely be a leech. Ew, get it off. We're trying, we're trying, stay calm. You don't want your heart rate to go up because more blood pumps so then they could, the leech sucks more of it out of you. Just stay calm. Here we are in our form, 1040. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, we've got Adam Taxman just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in Beverly Hills 90210 starting as a single filer we're going to imagine the schedule e rental income being the only kind of income to start with flowing through to line number eight at the 100,000 we have the standard deduction for a single filer 13,850 we have the taxable income 86,150 page two calculating the tax then at the 14266. Back to page one. We're focused in, of course, on this line number eight, which flowed in from the Schedule E, which we're imagining is our rental property. So we have then an income statement format, the 100,000 minus the 20,000. That's where we're getting this net income, in essence, of the rental property, which is flowing through to the Schedule 1, which is additional income and adjustments to income. Part number one, additional income, line five, rental real estate flowing through. There's the 100,000. It's flowing through to the Form 1040 on line number eight. Note that what we do not have here, we do not have a W-2, so we don't also then have the Social Security and Medicare withholdings paid through by the employer on the W-2. Also, we don't have the self-employment tax as we typically would have if it was a Schedule C type of business dealing with the in essence, equivalent of payroll taxes, Social Security and Medicare, which is typically calculated or possible or finally flowing through as taxes on page number two here. We don't therefore have half of that self-employment tax being an above the line deduction as we would with the Schedule C. We don't have anything on line 13, qualified business income deduction from form 85995 uh, eight, as we might have if we had the Schedule C business. We touched on that in prior presentations, just wanna just touch on it again here. Going back to the Schedule E, noting of course we have our income minus expenses. Income is usually gonna be pretty straightforward because that's what we're receiving in the form of rental payments if we have a rental property, for example. Expenses, like with the Schedule C, are generally ordinary and necessary 
expenses to generate the revenue, many of which are pretty straightforward. We've got advertising, auto and travel. It's a little bit confusing in a similar way as it is with the Schedule C business, having to make sure we account for things like the commuting and whether or not we're using the uh, mileage method or the direct method and so on and so forth. Uh, cleaning, commission, insurance, legal and professional management fees. These are pretty straightforward that from a bookkeeping standpoint, we would probably see the cash flow going out of our account related to our business here, related to our rental property and be able to account for them, possibly on a cash-based method, possibly using like a bank transactions feed in a software such as a QuickBooks or something like pretty straightforward. However, the depreciation is generally going to be something that is going to be more complex for us because we have to, even if we're on a cash-based system, deviate from that cash-based system, putting these things on the books as an asset, depreciating them over their useful life, similarly to what we would have to do on a Schedule C. But with a Schedule C business, if we have like gig work or something, Note that we might not have the actual property itself. We might not own an office building if we have a Schedule C service business. Whereas here, we do most likely own the building. So in our case, we might say that we have a second residence, for example, a second home, which we are not using as a second home, but rather renting it out. Therefore, it is rental property. That property itself then is something that might be uh, depreciable. So that's going to be a major component of course, for the rental property. Other things would need to be depreciated in a similar fashion as with a Schedule C, such as if you bought equipment or furniture or whatnot that are larger items that we'd have to then uh, depreciate as well according to the, the useful lives that are assigned to us by the tax code. So how does this work? We identify the property, we determine if, it, if it's something I can expense or I have to put it on the books as an asset and depreciate it. If we have to put it on the books as an asset, we need to determine what category it is in. And from the category, the QuickBook or this tax software will tell us how to depreciate it. What's going to be the method used, double declining straight line, for example, for the most part, what convention, mid-year, mid-month. Uh, mid quarter or something and what's the method straight line double declining uh, did I do the convention method and the number of years that we're going to be depreciating it so that's the general idea now as we do this we can compare and contrast it to some deductions you might see on the schedule a if it was your principal residence or possibly like a second home or something like that you might be able to deduct the interest on the loan related to it and possibly the property taxes. Notice that these are unusual because these are not ordinary and necessary expenses to generate revenue. They are, they are expenses for whatever reason, possibly lobbyists in the home construction area <laughs> most likely are the ones that push for these deductions because they're beneficial to, you know, that industry uh, is as of what I think basically happened, but it's kind of confusing because, and by the way, I say that because the argument is that they you could then you could then have affordable housing, but I think in the long run it's just going to wash out in the purchase the price of the housing and just make things more complex. Meaning the house is now going to be more expensive, plus but then you get a deduction for it, so it kind of gets to the same point in the long run. It's kind of the way I'm the way I think it kind of works out. But in any case, these are going to be items that can be a little confusing because they lead people to think that the Schedule E will have the same kind of deductions and you will be able to deduct possibly interest on the loan and possibly the real estate taxes, the state taxes, but now those are part of more legitimate expenses for an income tax system because they're being consumed in order for a business to help to generate the revenue. Notice what you do not have over here on the Schedule A, however, you're not expensing all the repairs, you're not expensing you know, improvements aren't going on here. You're not putting all that stuff on the books and you don't have a depreciation schedule with your principal residence because you don't get the benefit of depreciating it as an expense with your residence. If it's a Schedule E, not only do we get the big ones, which are the mortgage interest still and possibly property taxes, 
but we get all these other expenses because now it's actually an expense. The property is there to help us to generate revenue, maintenance on the property, therefore is an ordinary necessary business expense. And we also want to track the actual depreciation because we're gonna get the cost of the property allocated over the useful life of the property as a depreciation. Now, let me do a quick calculate. Let's say we bought the property and let's say the cost of the property was 150,000. So the first question that we have to say is, well, if it's 150,000, I need to be breaking out between the land and the building. How do I do that? So oftentimes what will happen is you might look at the property tax statement, which might not add up to 150, maybe it adds up to just 100,000. So it might be land is at, is at let's say uh, 40,000 and building, building is at 60,000. So the total there of course is 100,000. If I was to look at that, the sum of my property tax statement, the assessment of the property taxes is based on $100,000 appraisal value by the property taxes broken out 60 or 40, 60 land versus building, last land versus building. If I look at the ratio, I could say 40 over 100 is of course, on a percent basis, 40%, 60 over 100, to do over 100 is 60%. If I total those up, those out add up to 100, or in other words, one or 100, or in other words, 100 over 100 is 100%. So if I allocate that same thing to this 150,000, I can say, okay, land times the total cost of 150, building, 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 man, my fingers aren't working. Building 150,000 times the percent. We're gonna say land is 40, 60, percentify those. And that's gonna give us equals 150 times 40% 40 is 60, 150 times 60% is 90. That sums up to 150. So that's the first thing we might do. We might have to say, what's the actual cost? A lot of the things that are on the escrow statement, we might have to include and the cost or basis and so on and so forth. Once we get that amount, it might be something won't be as round as 150,000, but it might be something that we then need to break out between land and building. Noting that this whole process is a problem when you first buy the property, and or transfer the property from personal to, to business, to rental. Once it's on the books, it should be easy to calculate because the depreciation will be calculated by the software going forward. The bookkeeping side of things can take care of everything basically except depreciation and some other things like possibly the auto mileage, the auto expense and whatnot, because you have to do the mileage method possibly or something. And then and then we're going to, on our side, do a tax adjusting entry for the depreciation calculated by the software based on this information. So that's why it's difficult for the first year. And then it should be pretty easy to do the, to do the books going forward. So if I go back on over, then let's say we add a p depreciable property. We're going to say d -d -d deduction and let's say it's, uh, uh, so now when I put it on the books, I'm gonna put land on the books. It's gonna to go to my schedule E form. And if I have multiple schedule E's, I can I can ha I can then number the, the property. And then the category is gonna be land. I'm gonna imagine we put it in March, 60,000 for the land. Now I'm not gonna depreciate the land, but I'm gonna put it on my depreciation schedule so that I can see that that land and building tie out to the price of 150,000, the cost. The buildings also go to the schedule E. The category here is gonna be building 90,000 and this one's gonna be 27.5 because it's a residential rental building we are imagining here. So that's the, that's the general idea. Now you would possibly want to be more specific than just calling it land and building, possibly putting the address of it so that if you have multiple land and building in the future, you can identify the property you're talking about. We of course here being quite generic land and building. All right, let's go to the forms. And so now we have this calculation on the depreciation. 
Now, note, you might say, well, how are we going to calculate that? Because if I can't expense the cost of the building, I have to put it on the books as an asset. I have no balance sheet here. And therefore, where am I going to put the asset account of building? Well, we have a separate depreciation schedule now, usually, that will help us to do that. So here's our depreciation schedule. Let's pull out a trusty calculator and see, see if we can do some calculations with it. So we have the 90,000. So notice that the land bit down here, the, the 60,000 is not being depreciated. We're not, that's potential energy, potential deduction that we're not going to get any benefit from because they won't let us depreciate it. But we still may get a benefit or will at some point when we sell the property because that increased basis. So in other words, let's imagine that we it's been 27, 28 years later and the building is fully depreciated. The 90,000 has been depreciated. Well, I'm still going to have the 60,000 of the land that they wouldn't let me depreciate. So if I sell it for 100,000 at that point in time, instead of having a 100,000 of gain, which I might have to pay taxes on, it would be the 100,000 minus the 60,000, only 40,000 of gain. That's where that comes in as a benefit at the point of sale. But I don't get to depreciate it, which I would like to be able to do because I'd like to get the benefit sooner. The 90,000 is the part that I get to depreciate noting there that there is an incentive for us to try to overestimate if it was possible the amount allocated to building versus land given the fact that i get to consume some of the benefit the potential energy benefit of the building part versus the land i hope i said that right we want it to be building typically more than land because we might be able to depreciate it okay and then what's the depreciation so straight line this is a maker's depreciation you might be used to maker's depreciation for a schedule c usually allowing a double declining accelerated method but whenever you're talking about real estate property real property then typically you have to do it's going to use a straight line method and then it has an mm what is that that stands for a mid-month convention so in other words if you're used to other property you might be used to a mid year convention or a mid-quarter convention but for real estate it's usually mid-month which makes sense because it's such a large piece of property so we um, assume that we purchased it in the middle of march in this case and then it's going to be depreciated over the useful life 27.5 years and then here's the rate so if it was a straight if you figured the the amount then usually you'd calculate it like this textbook style you'd say it's 90,000 divided by 27.5 that would be 3,272 per year which is what it is going to be in the following year right 3,272 and 2024 but in this year we're imagining that we didn't purchase it until uh March so therefore we're going to have so let's break this out to a per month amount. So I'm going to take that and divide it by 12. So if that's per year, we have 272 per month. And we're going to imagine that we bought it in the middle of February. So that's two full months and half of another month. So 12 minus 2.5 is going to be 9.5 months that we had it. So I'm going to say times 9.5. And that's where we get this 2,590. So the amount that we get to deduct is 2590 which is of course pulling in to uh, the schedule E. There's the 2590 We can also take a look at the form 4562, depreciation and amortization. Uh, and the first part of this, we talk about this more in, a, in another course or section. But part one, election to expense certain property under the 179. So we're not typically looking at the 179 when dealing with uh, real estate and then part two special depreciation allowance which again possibly not there if you're dealing with the real estate and then we have the maker's depreciation where our category is the residential rental property the 90,000 27.5 years mid-month straight line there's the 2,591 uh, once again flowing into the schedule e now, a couple things that will make this more complicated or could be different in terms of the complications is that uh, if, I if I purchase the property, I'm going to have the closing statement and all of that stuff 
to help me to figure out what the cost is, which I can then break out between the the building and the land. But if I was to inherit the property, then you have the question of what's going to be the, the basis in the property. Uh, is it the basis at the time that, that of death of the person who, who you inherited it from, or is it his basis before that, or is it the fair market value? Similarly, if the property was gifted to you, you have a similar situation. What's the basis of the property? Is it the pr basis of the property of the other person that gifted it to you? Is there a strategy that you might have because of the difference between a gift versus an inheritance for estate tax planning strategies? And we also have the situation where it might be personal property. We might have lived in it. It might have been our home. And then we moved from the home and then we rented it after that point in time, in which case, again, we have the question of what's going to be the basis of the property because I didn't just purchase it. Is it the adjusted basis when I trans when I when I uh, purchased the property like 30 years ago or something like that? Or is it going to be the fair market value? It might be the lesser of the two. The fair market value at this time being more difficult to calculate than you would think because it's unique in nature, a home or real estate is, and therefore you'd have to have some kind of appraisal to think about what the current you know, fair market value is to compare to the cost or purchase price. Also remember that you're not gonna have depreciation schedules to tell you what the adjusted basis is if it was personal property of yourself or the person who you inherited it from or who gifted it to you unless they were renting it because if it was personal property, they're, they're track, they only get a benefit from the mortgage interest. So you're gonna have to figure out then, okay, what was the original cost of the property? What were the improvements on the property and so on and so forth to try to figure out uh, what the basis was. Once you have that again, once you put it on the books, then it's a little bit more straightforward. Now, the other thing we'll talk more about in future presentations is, what if I'm only renting part of the properties for rental, part of it's for personal use, either because I own the property, it's my principal residence, and I rent part of it, in which case, do I get to depreciate the part of the property that's rental? Does that impact my my exemption if I was to sell the property as my principal residence? Those are questions we have to keep in mind. And, or the other scenario, it's vacation home. It's a separate property that I use for part of the year. So now it's partially personal use, partially for rental use. And then once again, we have the question of how can we allocate costs such as for such as the depreciation, the expenses, which are being allocated for the entire property over the personal and business, the depreciation possibly not being deductible on uh, the personal side. We also have to keep in mind the fact that as we depreciate it, the value of the, the, the potential energy goes down, right? So as we depreciate more, if I go to the next year, then this 90,000 that I hope to get a tax benefit from at some point is going down because after the second year, the depreciation has been 3272 plus the 2591 accumulated depreciation is at 5863 so that brings the book value of just the building part down minus 90,000 to 84 uh, 137 this is the potential energy the potential deduction which is going down as i consume it with the tax benefit of the depreciation which means that when i sell it I'm going to more likely have a gain or less of a loss because if I sell it for, if I sell this, then, then I'm going to have less of a basis to eat into the, to the, to the gain because it's going to be sales price minus the adjusted basis will be uh, the gain, which leads to questions of, well, if it was my personal residence, then I might be able to exempt some of the gain, which leads to the question, could I move into the property was, which was previously rented so that I can live in it, qualifying it as my principal residence so that when I sell it, although I have this gain, it might be exempted because it was my principal residence. Or is there a way that I can transfer the lowered eaten up basis in the property to another property if I was to exchange it in a 1031 exchange which basically defers the gain by keeping that lowered potential energy, but transferring it kind of into the new property, which gets quite complex sometimes. But another thing just to keep in mind when you're thinking about the depreciation and the relation to the eventual 
sale of the property, which will have tax implications as well. All right, now then there's questions, of course, of improvements on the property. So notice from a bookkeeping standpoint, if there were improvements on the property, let's say they, they fixed the roof or something like that, the question is, can I put that under repairs here and expense it, which is what I would like to do, because I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all of the benefit of the expense up front. Or do I have to put it on the books as an asset? And if I put it on the books as an asset, then I don't get the benefit. I have to depreciate it over its useful life. Now, so that some some things are in kind of gray areas. Uh, in this area. So if you have a lot from a bookkeeping standpoint, if there's a lot of money in repairs, that's possibly what the IRS would look at if repairs is really large compared to the re revenue of similar types of property, then that could be a red flag. And they're going to say, hey, look, there's a bunch of stuff in here that you possibly should have put on the books as an asset, not taking the tax benefit up front, but allocating it uh, over uh, the useful life. So that's something we have to be careful of from a bookkeeping standpoint. Anytime there's a large purchase, they might run that by, for example, the CPA firm or tax preparer to make sure or properly categorize between you know repairs and, uh, and putting on the books as an asset. And as a tax preparer, you might you know peruse over these numbers and say, is that repairs quite large? Do I wanna look into the repairs and double check that uh, none of those items should be on the books as an asset. Now, if it goes on the books as an asset, then you have the question of, I would rather have it on the books as an asset that has a lower life span uh, so that I can get the depreciation sooner. So in other words, if I have to put it on the books over here, I would rather not have it as an improvement if possible, because those are still gonna be depreciated most likely over 27.5 years. If I can put it on the books as equipment or something like that, then I might be able to depreciate it over a much lower lifespan, like five to seven years or something like that. And I might get the benefit of a special depreciation as well as maybe, or the 179 deduction, basically allowing me to expense it up front, which would be more beneficial. So the question is always gonna be, is it is it something I have to put on the books as an asset? or can I, can I expense it? I would rather expense it. If I have to put it on the books as an asset, is there any way I can put it on the books as something other than improvements? Because that's gonna result in a much shorter useful life, possibly allow me special and 179 depreciation, or do I have to put it on the books as an improvement, which means I'm gonna have to put it on as another line item, but depreciate it over this huge, long, useful life, 27 years, and only get a straight line method as opposed to a double declining method. Now also note that if we have an improvement, if you bought the home and then you improved it before you started renting it, that improvement will typically be in the cost of the, of the property, right? Because you haven't yet put it in service. If the thing is already in service, and then you make an improvement to it, like a few years later, then you're not gonna change the original cost here, but rather have another line item of improvements that will then, that will use typically the same method of depreciation as would be used if you put it on the books as a new rental property in, this, in the current time frame. So we wouldn't have it in the same year, but let's just imagine improvements. What would that look like? So let's imagine that they weren't in the same year. This happened before, and then we had improvements. So we put in a new roof. Let's say new roof. And we're gonna say this is gonna be schedule E, da -da, and we're gonna call this one improvements. And let's that ha happen on 1201. Two, three. So again, it wouldn't normally happen on the same year, but we're just going to say, okay, we'll, we'll just test it out here just to see what it looks like on the depreciation schedules. And the and, and so now we're going to say that it's going to be once again, uh, the, the, the 27.5 years, this long time frame. And then I'm going to put it on over and say, okay, what does that look like on the improvements? And so now we have the schedule E, the buildings on the book, I didn't change the basis of the building, but I put the the improvements on, which at least we get to depreciate them, unlike the land, but we're and we're depreciating them under the method, straight line, mid-month, 
27.5 years that would be the method used if you were to buy the new property at this point in time, which is the same method, of course, because we have it in the same time as, in this case, the building. So we get a very small bit of that $30 of the 20,000 instead of if I was just to, able to expense it up front as a repair, I would get the 20,000. All right, so let's imagine that now that we bought something else and let's imagine that we bought something like, what if it was like a, a, a an air conditioner, but it wasn't part of the part of the building, but it was like an external air conditioner or something that wasn't attached to the building maybe. And, and maybe I can, maybe I can say, instead of it being a $20,000, uh, improvement, I can categorize it as equipment. Let's just, um, th just to look at the difference of it. So in other words, what if I bought equipment and I said, okay, now I'm saying I can't put it on the books as repairs, but instead of putting it on the books as improvements, I could put it on the books as seven year property or something like that. And there's a substantial difference, right? So if I was to say, okay we've got we've got uh seven some kind of seven year property and let's say this was uh schedule e residential property and this time we're going to say it's machinery and equipment like say oh uh oh seven oh one uh two three and we put that let's say it was ten thousand and so let's say now this is going to be seven year property. So we'll say it's seven year office equipment, fixtures and others. It might more likely be five. Well, let's just keep it seven. Year. We'll just say it's seven year property. So if I if I pull that on over and say, OK, what about that kind of property? Boom. So so now we have the building, the improvements to land and then the machinery a seven year property. Notice what the software did automatically. It said, hey, you're going to qualify possibly for a special depreciation. And it allowed me to take this massive amount up front, which is almost equivalent to basically just allowing me to expense most of it up front, making the 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 new basis from 10,000, we ate up 8,000 to 2000. And then I also get the double declining rate. Uh, and it's a half year convention instead of a half month convention. So much more accelerated depreciation method here, even if I didn't get this big special depreciation, which is huge, I've got this accelerated depreciation and you might be able to qualify more of it as section 179 deduction if it, if it wasn't qualified as real estate. That means now I'm taking in essence the whole thing up front and and getting the benefit almost equivalent to or basically equivalent to me just being able to write it off up front which is a which would be huge right so that's why just in general the thought process and then if i look at this form here now to, now i've got depreciation amortization i got the seven year property uh that we're calculating for the 179 deduction so there's the 10,179. i removed the special and then here's our properties down here for the residential rental property 27.5 and that's pulling over to the schedule e so what we're keeping in mind as we as we work on our property is i i i'm gonna have this huge long time i have to depreciate building and improvements over as i make improvements i would like to make them in such a way that i can categorize as much as possible into repairs and maintenance versus putting it on the books as a capital asset. If I have to put it on the cap books as a capital asset, I would rather not call it improvements. I would rather be able to put it on the books as five year or seven year property if it was possible. And if I can't do that and I have to put it on the books as improvements, then I'm going to not going to get a tax benefit for it typically, except over a very long, you know, time frame. Now we talk a lot more about depreciation for for other property and special depreciation and 179 in another course or section so you can take a look at, at those in more detail just to dive into depreciation that we we talked about more like in a course or section on the schedule c and depreciation related to it we're going to focus more here on kind of the new thing the, the depreciation related to the real estate now i also want to point out as we put these on the books People often get confused with what a loan means. 
So, so, and I just, and I want to try to clarify this because, and again, I think this is the common phrase that people say, I don't own my home. The bank owns my home or they own 80% of my home. And that's because they have the home as collateral. But when you're thinking about putting the home on the books, that's not really the case. That's an overstatement. That's people trying to be like more humble or something, I think is what that started out being where they're trying to say, I don't really own the home. The bank owns it. I'm, you know, I, I don't, you know, but what, so there might be a substantial loan, but that's different from them owning the home. And we can see that like if you had your principal residence, then, then you get the benefit of on the principal residence on the schedule A possibly deducting uh, the interest related to uh, the loan. But the, the loan, it, remember, is a liability. So you have to pay back. So what's happening is you took a loan out, you put the home on as collateral so that if you default on the home, on paying back the loan, then they ha have some recourse. And the recourse is somewhat limited by basically ha saying that they're going to, they're going to, uh, take the property and sell it and so on, but that's not what they really want to do. So you, you take the money and then you use that money to buy the home. That does mean you have a loan outstanding with the house as collateral, which is equivalent to like 80% of the fair market value of the home. But the loan is something different because you're paying like rent on the purchasing power of the money in the form of interest. So the interest you're paying is the rent of the purchasing power which you used to buy the property. Again, the bank doesn't have any control over what you do with the home. They can't come to your kitchen table and knock on the door and say, I'm coming in. I own 80% of this place, dang it. Get me, go, get me some of that meatloaf and let's talk about what color we're gonna paint the living room. They can't do that. So, so it's, it's different. So that means that when we put this on the books, the property on the books, some people would say, well, I should only be able to put on the books, uh, you know, 80% of it the, for the amount that, that, I mean, 20%, the amount we didn't finance, but no, you put the full cost on the books, no matter generally, no matter how you paid for it, whether it be with money that you borrowed or money that, that you traded for it or something, or you paid services for it or something, the cost is what we're going to put and depreciate on the books and the financing will be on the books as a liability liabilities not seen on the schedule e because this is the income statement and not the balance sheet it would be on the bookkeeping on the balance sheet side for a liability for the loan and we will see the impact of the loans the rental payments on the purchasing power of the loans in the form of interest, which is a legitimate deductible expense because it's an ordinary and necessary expense. We needed to get the financing in order to buy the property in order to generate the revenue.